Hello, I'm Darshini David. Welcome to Generation Green, brought to you by Project Syndicate. Humanity is at a turning point. Either we choose to dramatically change the way we live or fail to act and risk a rise in global temperatures that forces change upon us. One way or another, it seems likely that the next quarter century will be defined by climate change. So, will we all, the young, the old, and those of us in the middle, be defined by history as Generation Green? The people who lived through the climate epoch, and if so, how will it judge us? We'll be hearing from Ban Ki-moon, the former UN Secretary General and Deputy Chair of the Elders, Patricia Espinoza, the Executive Secretary of the UN FCCC. Yvonne Akisoya is the mayor of Freetown, Catherine Hayhoe, the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy, and Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland and chair of the Elders. We'll also be joined by a selection of the most exciting and important young climate activists from around the world. But the most important people we'll hear from today is you, the audience watching. So... Do please join the conversation and get involved on social media using the hashtag Generation Green. Speaking of which... Just a few moments will be coming to our first panel of the day. But first, a quick word of thanks to our sponsors for the day. The Elders are a group of former world leaders. It was founded by Nelson Mandela, who worked for peace, justice and human rights. The Nature Conservancy are one of the most effective and wide-reaching environmental organisations in the world. So thank you to them. Now, I'm delighted to introduce the panel for our first session of the day, Climate Futures. After last year's COP26 meetings in Glasgow, it heralded some but limited success. What's next? Is it realistic to hope that 2022 can herald a generation-defining breakthrough? Who better to help answer that question than Yvonne Akisoya, who's mayor of Freetown? Catherine Hayhoe is chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy and Zaid Rad al Hassan is former United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights and a member of the Elders. It's also his birthday today, so congratulations and the very best from all of us. We are thrilled you've chosen to spend it with us. We'll come to them in just a moment, but first, with her assessment of both COP26 and the road ahead, here's Patricia Espinoza. Executive Secretary of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the organization in charge of those COP meetings. Dear friends, it's a pleasure to speak with you in these early days of 2022. I recognize that not everyone was happy with what we achieved in Glasgow. I was also not completely satisfied. This 
however, is the reality of diplomacy and multilateralism. But let us focus on what we did achieve, where we stand after COP26, and examine the road ahead to COP27. In Glasgow, nearly 200 nations came together and provided clarity on the work we need to undertake to reach the 1.5 degree goal under the Paris Agreement. For the first time ever, coal was mentioned in the final text. We saw progress with respect to mitigation, adaptation and finance. Outside of the formal process, China and the United States agreed to work together in areas of common interest. Parties also decided on the rules to implement the carbon markets under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Despite COP26 accomplishments, however, the undeniable truth is that we are still far off the trajectory of stabilizing global temperature rise at 1.5 degrees. It's why COP26 was not the end of anything. It was an important step forward, but our work and the work of parties continues towards COP27. There are several areas of focus and many requiring immediate attention. First, we need more ambitious NDCs and long-term strategies. We simply do not have enough, and not enough ambition at the current time. The NDC synthesis reports from last year confirmed this. That's why nations following a resolution at COP26 are now asked to come up with stronger plans on an annual basis. No country is exempt. It's crucial G20 nations lead by example as they represent 80% of the world's emissions. They must focus on immediate action. I'm often asked how optimistic I am that parties will follow up on their commitments. I am always optimistic. I would not be in this position if I wasn't. I am absolutely convinced the multilateral process is the only way forward. But currently, climate change is outpacing multilateralism. Just because it's uncomfortable to keep delivering this message does not make it any less necessary. Optimism is only possible when it is backed by action. On the road to COP27, much more support needs to be provided to developing countries. We welcome the call by parties to at least double finance for adaptation. But actual needs are still very much beyond what is currently available. Youth, observers, and civil society as a whole must play a more central role on the road to and at COP27. In short, we need Generation Green. I look forward to the results of your discussions, and I look forward to meeting as many of you in person as possible and as soon as possible. Thank you. Patricia Espinosa there with many crucial points we'll be picking up. Uh, she, of course, is the Executive Secretary of the UNFCC. Well, we'll be hearing just in a little while from uh, journalists around the world. They'll have their questions for the panel. But before we get started with that panel, just one more reminder. If you'd like to join the conversation or help share the word today, we'd be delighted. Get involved using the gen hashtag Generation Green. But without any further ado, let me formally welcome back our panel once again. I welcome them once more, uh, Catherine, Yvonne and Zaid. Welcome to you. I should say all three of you were at COP26, so you witnessed many of the events we'd start off talking about. And Alex Sharma, as we've been hearing, hearing from there a little bit earlier, the president of COP26, said he was deeply sorry for the way th things turned out in Glasgow. Uh, Zaid, was he right to apologise? Well, it's a, it's a very strange process, COP, uh, 26 rounds uh, in a, a system which is vastly different from the way we negotiate other things. And so the, there's an enormous burden on the presidency to produce a result, and it's not always connected to the negotiations at a technical level. I, I think the most dramatic aspect of the negotiations, and I was in the loss and damage discussions, was that there was a complete absence of the energy 
that you felt outside the gates of the conference center. The, the dissipation is amazing. So you go from the street, Greta, the green zone, the blue zone, where you have civil society, environmental activists. By the time you arrive in the in negotiation room, that nothing of that exists, nothing. There's no sense of urgency. There's no sense of the dramatic. And, um, and then you hear the comments made to the press outside and you don't know what world you're really living in. Um, it's rather dramatic. And uh, how we bring that energy, the desire, the desperation in one way into the negotiations is the central task, I think. So you'd hold the people in that room responsible for the failure to get there, aid. Well, I, I think, you know, they've been doing this for 26 years. Uh, this is how they think it ought to be done. It's, very, it's a very clinical sort of discussion of text and wordsmithing, almost devoid of the urgency that I think many of us feel, and IPCC reports have continuously sort of brought this to public attention. But there's a sort of tranquilizing effect that governments have you know, when they insert themselves into these issues. And it all becomes, you know, uh, about a, a certain number of words being positioned in the right way. Well, I think in the end, the objective seems to be lost, at least in the, in the discussions that I was involved with. Oh, that's a really interesting perspective. So, Catherine, I want to bring you in here because I could see you smiling and nodding during some of that. Uh, what's for you stopped COP26 living up to the expectations somehow? Did we have the wrong expectations? Well, I was smiling at the phrase, the tranquilizing effect, because I think that's very apt. And there was no tranquilizing effect outside the negotiating chambers, either in the blue zone or outside on the street. <clears throat> we understand the urgency. And to me, the most encouraging aspect of COP was not what was happening with the country delegates inside the national negotiations. It was the fact that wherever you turned, you saw representatives of every aspect of civil society. You saw some of the largest corporations in the world, whether Amazon, Nestle, Ikea. You saw organizations like the Rotary Club. You saw large faith-based organizations like the Church of England. You saw young people, children, grandparents, students, people from every walk of life were there to advocate for climate action because they understood that climate change is not only an international issue. Climate change is not only an environmental issue. Climate change is an everything and everyone issue. And that is why every voice is needed. And Yvonne, I could see you nodding there. I know you're also, you've got an interesting title, the Chief Heat Officer for Africa as well. Um, we can look at a photo of uh, the world leaders at COP26, which is uh, quite telling, really. Many noted that when you look at this, so you can see lots of men are over the age of 50, and, and that's in very stark contrast to the people who we're hearing there uh, about from Catherine, you know, the people standing outside the younger, more diverse protesters. So that sort of lack of representation at the table, uh, how is that sort of fed into the outcome we've seen? Um, yes, thanks a lot. And the, the chief heat officer is not my title, it's the title of one I'm of my sorry. staff. We recently appointed, no, no, it's not a problem. I think that the point is still well made, that there's an increasing need for these different skills and competencies to address issues of climate change. But to your point about the disconnect um, between not just the conversations that are happening within the negotiations, but and in, and in fact, probably because those doing the negotiations um, sadly are not as representative of the, the people outside of that room, the people who are outside the gate and in different zones. But um, just picking up on what Zaid said, um, our, our task as we run, as we walk, move in the run up to COP27 is to change that dynamic, to ensure that the pressure, the, the, the excitement, the sense of urgency, which is outside that negotiating room, comes into the room. And as has been said already, there have been 26 COPs, um, and the pressure outside keeps building. And yet the, the cocoon, the bubble um, within that negotiation, negotiating room seems to remain intact. Um, and I think our, our challenge now, and there are many different sort of um, routes towards that is to ensure that we break that bubble um, and through voting, because that's a, you know, beginning to make sure that those in the room feel the impact when it comes to their governance um, in, in their nation states.
And talking of, you know, the influence from the grassroots up, what was the, the interest, the awareness in Freetown of COP26 and what was the reaction to what happened? I was actually surprised. I think this is the first COP that has caught the attention of, 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 our, of our city and, and of our country. Um, people followed it, people, and, and possibly because we had, I mean, I was there in my capacity as C40 Cities, and because of the work that we're doing in Freetown, um, on Freetown, the tree town, the planting of a million trees, we had quite a bit of media coverage. Um, the, the government was there as well, and there were some contrasts being made uh, again, in a way, very similar to what we're talking about on a global scale, that you have conversations that don't seem to be quite hitting the point um, in terms of the urgency, the practical interventions and policy changes that are required when you're speaking at that sort of national level, vis-a-vis -vis what you know is, is being said by civil society, by, by women's groups, by youth movements, um, and indeed by, by cities. Let's talk a little bit of you know the possible action we could see, the solutions potentially. Uh, Zaid, just have a look at this. We're going to put this number up on screen. This is a, a, the number by the Climate Action Tracker showing uh, what percentage of global emissions are now covered by net zero targets. We're up to 90%. Does that make you hopeful? These are just targets. Well, I mean, look, we can point to certain indicators and always feel or want to feel hopeful. I mean, it's a deep human <laughs> desire, of course, because it's so intimately linked to our own sense of survival and purpose. Um, but I think the, the countervailing trends are also frightening. If you look at the burning embers uh, graphic in the IPCC report, it's a rather famous graphic. Um, it shows you how perilous we are to total disruption of some very key and essential parts of the human experience. The food supply disruptions could be absolutely severe, uh, food stability, food security, if we hit 2.0. And, um, and you know, the projections take us beyond that. We're, we're desperately clinging on, I hope to cling on to 1.5. Um, but with the competency or incompetency and the mediocrity of so many uh, sort of government leaders around the world, it, w it will require other points of power um, or, let's say, other hands on, on the tiller to sort of shift this. It, we can't simply depend on the very people who've landed us in this mess to sort it out. It will require a combination of uh, key uh, individuals, some in government, many outside to, to turn this around. So, yes, I, I think you can always point to some hopeful trajectories. Yeah. Let's bring Catherine in here because, uh, you know, have Catherine as well. Of course, these are net zero pledges. They're not absolute zero pledges, and they rely a lot on, on things like planting trees to offset carbon. It's all rather controversial, isn't it? Well, I think Zaid was very clear that certainly this is a good step in the right direction, but it isn't enough, and it isn't enough because enough people still don't realise what's at stake. Climate change is still often seen as an environmental issue that we really should fix. But if we don't fix it, oh well, maybe we'll be okay. Unfortunately, that is not the case. It is not about saving the planet. It is about saving our civilization. As he said, it is our food systems, our infrastructure, our economy at risk. The economy cannot float around in outer space mm. without the resources that this planet provides. And when we realize what's at stake, the question is not... Are we doing too much or spending too much to try to fix the problem? The question is rather, we need to do everything we can. There is no such thing as too much. Otherwise, we, there will be nothing. I'm glad you said everything we can, because there's some quite innovative solutions. I wanted to have a look at this picture here. I, might, I feel like asking you to guess what it is, because it may not look like it, but it's the world's largest carbon sucking machine launched last September in Iceland. It takes carbon from the air, it deposits it underground. It's pretty clever technology, this. It can currently absorb the equivalent of around 800 cars. So, Catherine, how much hope do you have for measures like this? It's not the prettiest of things, is it? Mm -hmm. It isn't, but it shows the ingenuity of humans when we're confronted with an issue that we really understand the risks of, as those people do, we understand that we need all solutions on deck. There is no silver bullet. There is no one solution that will fix everything. But there's a lot of solutions from good old-fashioned efficiency, 
I live in the United States where through efficiency alone, carbon emissions could be cut in half. Then there's clean energy technology. Then there are nature-based solutions where we put carbon back into the soil and back into ecosystems where we want it instead of the atmosphere where we have too much of it. And then, of course, there are cutting-edge technology solutions like that that suck carbon out of the air and put it into the ground. We need everything. We need all hands on deck. We need farmers and city planners. We need engineers and financial investors. We need everyone because we're all at risk. If I, when we hear about what a coordinated effort it's got to be, is 1.5 still alive for you? The challenge we have is that 1.5 is what we need. And I think I just want to pick up on what Kate said just now. Um, and, and also what was what was said by the UNCFF, uh, UNFCC president. Um, we've got to be optimistic. We know that the data tells us now that 1.5, I think the expression that's being used is on life support, mm. that we're likely to go 2.4, but 2.4 is already past the burning ember point. So, I mean, I think what's been missing, and let's come back to um, that, that, that description that was used earlier on, the sense of urgency, the sense of panic even, um, um, the sense of, of desperation that was experienced, was seen, was felt by in certain quarters at COP, um, in contrast to that calm, sort of very, you know, sort of staid, uh, um, sterile negotiating uh, experience within the negotiating room. We can't take we, we can't take our lives uh, um, in our hands as we're doing. We can't talk about this like it's some nice to have. So um, I'm going to throw this back at you a little bit, um, Dashini, because you asked the question as if we have an option, and I want us to stop doing that. I want us to all actually talk as though, look, if this doesn't happen. We won't have a planet with, you know, whose economy we need to protect. We won't have the people to protest about the jobs. Yes, we appreciate that those who continue to deny the science, who say that this is not real. Mm -hmm. We appreciate that there is this, this narrative which pushes back on what the science is saying. But increasingly, I believe we've got the physical evidence, you know, our own lived experience. Um, whether it's the fires, whether it's the floods, whether it's the melting ice, um, we are seeing it. And we need maybe a, a very powerful role that when we talk about who's going to help us change that temperature in the negotiating room by 2027, maybe the media is going to be a really big part of that push. And uh, Vaughan, that's a really good point, and that's a, a real call to arms, and frankly, a reminder, we just can't leave it to the people who are sat at those tables. It's up to all of us. So I just want to remind those who are watching that they are part of this. Uh, don't forget to join the conversation and help spread the word using the hashtag Generation Green. Uh, but uh, let's move on to some of the obstacles here, because there's one real big issue for all of us around the globe at the moment. And because when our aid, people are saying in surveys that they're generally positive about the need uh, for carbon reduction, but the reality is that we're also quite capable of demanding cheap energy at a huge political cost to leaders. Now, we're just going to show you some pictures now. These are from Kazakhstan, where earlier this month there were just five days between removing a price cap on fuel, and the scenes you can see here are the riots erupting and the government resigning. So we can criticise leaders for not taking more action at COPs, but it's important to recognise that back at home there's huge pressure from populations, not just there, around the globe, to maintain their way of life. We're pretty much hooked on our old habits, aren't we? What want to use well, well, I mean, it's a strange question, of course, because the poor governance produces these effects. You know, it's not just a combination of the, the you know, aggregate of policies, poor policy planning over the last 20 years has, that has led us here. It's poor governance that produces the, the reactions by populations. It's all part of the same thing, the climate change is a symptom of global poor governance. And uh, we elect poor leaders. We uh, indulge in superficialities. We turn everything into oversimplifications. And it's not to say that all of this is beyond our grasp. I think, you know, Yvonne and, uh, clearly made the case that we can change. 
in, in actual fact, I, I don't think it's all hands on deck. And yes, you, you do need the rebellion from below decks to force the, the captains at the, with their hands on the tiller to begin to think. But it is only a few, I think, that can change much of what is happening. And, uh, but it's not the traditional centers of power. You know, we, we can't look at heads of governments and heads of, um, and heads of states to do this. And again, they've landed us in this mess. <laughs> we have to think about this, right? So it's going to require a different way of thinking. When you look at COP, COP is a very strange process, right? It's, it's almost like you set up a bakery to produce salami. And then we're upset that the salami doesn't look anything like what we expect it to look like. Well, the whole setup is insane. It doesn't make much sense if you look at it. We need to sort of rethink how to make it produce. We have the global stock take coming up in 2023. We have one year to prepare for it. There's a series of very serious papers going in. You're focusing entirely on mitigation. There's a very serious discussion on adaptation that will have to take place and on finance and on, on loss and damage. Indeed. And that all has to be incorporated as well. Yeah, we'll get on to the issues of finance in, in just a while. But, you know, in terms of what actually did happen at uh, COP, uh, Yvonne, many people will remember, and in fact we had a reminder of it earlier, that last minute change to the text when India insisted on changing the commitment from phasing out coal to phasing down. Now, this is a crucial issue, isn't it? Because we're asking many developing countries uh, to forego perhaps some increase in living standards if they are to meet uh, some of the, the climate standards we want to see. So um, how do we balance the need to reduce poverty with the need to actually curb our emissions? So, I mean, I think this is where the conversation about um, a just green transition comes in and the question of equity. Um, you know, countries in the global south have the right to grow. Um, what we're facing, what we're experiencing now, I think it was earlier on, um, G20 represents 80% of world emissions. Um, if you represent 80% of world emissions, um, then you must be taking a proportionate responsibility in terms of how we address that. Uh, and that would mean, that would imply that those who make up that 20% are not being given the same burden because they've got many, you know, huge uh, uh, percentages, proportions of their population who are living be below the poverty line and to develop, they need energy. And a lot is said, a lot of discussion is had about this question of, you know, transitioning. I've been in fora where we, where, you know, we've seen um, multinational institutions, um, you know, Bretton Woods institutions mm -hmm. introducing uh, restrictions on investment on, on fuel, fo fossil fuel, uh, energy providers in countries where they have no base. You know, we, we, we cannot, we, we really have to think about this very carefully because we have already a huge divide, a huge inequality in the world yeah. sort of order. And we can't allow this kind of discussion to en allow, enable that to become wider. So I would say that the developing countries cannot become victims of something we've got to do at a global stage. When you, when you look at it in, on a merged level, we should still make the progress we need to make, but there should be a disproportionate burden carried by those who disproportionately got us here. The, the bigger polluters historically. What about the issue of mitigation, Yvonne? What should we be doing there? So mitigation is, is obviously goes hand in hand with where the emission is coming from. But as we've already well, maybe we haven't said, but let's say it now. Um, in as much as 80% of the emissions are coming from, you know, the global north, um, the, there's a disproportionate impact, the consequences on the global south, um, which means that adaptation, becoming more resilient, having more infrastructure investment is needed in the global south. But this is another area where, sadly, COP failed us. Um, we've been talking about, you know, 300 billion uh, a 300 billion financing gap. Um, commitments have been made in the past. They've not been honored. And here we are again. We've come to the end of COP26. And there's still no clarity. There is still no real commitment. There's still no accountability for how that funding, which is desperately needed, and the conversation still continues to be predominantly about mitigation. It's right for it to be about mitigation. Because there are people whose lives are being destroyed today. Yeah. And adaptation is the 
anything we can do to help them. Well, let's hear from Catherine on this because, um, you know, we're now coming up towards the next COP. What do we need to make it a success? What are the barriers here? Mm -hmm. We have three choices when it comes to climate action. We can mitigate, which means reduce our emissions and take carbon out of the atmosphere. We can adapt and build resilience to the changes that are already here today that cannot be avoided. Or we can suffer. And as John Holder and a fellow scientist once said, we are going to do some of each. The only question is how much? Because the faster we cut our emissions, the more carbon we take out of the atmosphere, the less adaptation is required and the less suffering there will be. And uh, to put it a different way, there's... Oh, yeah, go, go sorry, you were, you were about to say something. Let, I'll let you finish that. I, w I was going to say the barriers are not scientific. Mm -hmm. We've known since the 1850s that digging up and burning fossil fuels produces heat-trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. The barriers are primarily solution aversion. People think somehow that the solutions, the fix, the cure, is worse than the disease. But the reality is there are many solutions that clean up our air and our water, help us grow more food, lift people out of poverty. Oh, and they help with climate change too. And we need to be implementing those solutions as soon as possible, as much as possible. Well, Catherine, when it comes to nailing down those solutions, you know, we often hear the younger people speaking the loudest on the issues. But are they necessarily the ones who have the plausible solutions? And where sh who should be speaking up on this? There are many solutions, and there are young people who are coming up with some of those solutions. But there are also people in the engineering sector, the finance sector, the business sector, the food sector, agriculture sector. There are incredible plethora of solutions everywhere we look. As I said, there's no silver bullet, but there are plenty of silver buckshot, so to speak, at every level. So whether we're speaking of um, an individual household or a city or a company or corporation, nonprofit, land management system, a, a, a country or a province, there are solutions at every scale that can be implemented. Some of them are agricultural solutions, some are nature-based solutions, some are planning solutions, engineering solutions, lifestyle choice solutions. There are solutions at every scale to implement, and we know what a lot of those are. Project Drawdown is a great resource that lists over 100 solutions. The barrier, again, is not knowledge at this point. The barrier is we don't think we can fix it. We lack a sense of efficacy. We don't think we can make a difference, but the reality is our action is the only thing that can. So get up there and do it. Well, Said, you're a member of the Elders. Now, that organisation often speaks about the need for hope when it comes to world events, but really, hope, is that what we need to overcome? on these problems or do we need to see something a bit more tangible, a bit more hard-edged and leading by example? Well, it's, it's both. Nothing is mutually exclusive, right? We need hope. We need to think in a, in a very practical manner, uh, basically, and that's what uh, is being done. You know, the whole concern is, would it be too pinprick? Um, would it be too late? Uh, would the epitaph of the human experience be, you know, they finally managed to get their act to uh, together, but it was too late for them, and it was too late for the biosphere, mm -hmm. the, the rate at which biodiversity is you know, being destroyed, our inability to, uh, you know, implement the pledges, the declarations. You know, we're very good at actually conceiving of solutions, but following through right to the end seems to be very difficult for humankind, for the political bodies that sort of are charged with doing this and that has to somehow we have to somehow change that it's no good just starting an initiative but it's uh, expanding it and financing it and then bringing everyone uh, along with it um and so yes of course i mean we, we have to be hopeful uh, but we're perilous, perilously close to the edge and i think the, the critical thing is that we there is <laughs> there's a very narrow band of of our uh, in, within our sort of life experience, where we needed to need to be excited enough to do something, mm -hmm. but we don't want to also panic if we're driven too far, and we don't want to be driven into a sense of despondency and believing that it's all hopeless. And it's working within that narrow band of sort of a fizz, if I can have, that produces the most creativity and, and thought um, thinking through this. You know, finally, on, on youth, youth, we desperately need the energy. I, I worry, though, that there's too much youth uh, washing taking place, where, as we saw in COP, we had some outstanding youth leaders speak in the plenary. But that was about it. 
you know, you bring them along, they speak, they leave, and no effect in the, in the room, in the negotiating room. And yes, I think it's true that most of the solutions are outside of the formal negotiations. That's, that's absolutely true. But there has to be also a nexus to what is being discussed in detail, because all those issues are going to, as, we, as you said in the beginning, they're just going to grow in importance over the next few years, and we have a, some very big issues coming down the track. We have we some big to... issues, and we also have, a, to, to bear in mind who's going to be most affected. Yvonne, if you take a look at this map, I'm sure you're not going to be surprised by what it shows, because it shows the median age around the world in 2050, and by then we are likely to be living in a climate that is transformed in many ways. And sub-Saharan Africa is arguably the region of the world most likely to be hurt by those soaring temperatures. And guess what? The median person living in the region isn't even born yet. So what obligation does this generation, I say generation, everybody of all ages watching, people alive today, have towards them? Particularly in the situation where you mentioned earlier, Yvonne, where uh, we're not quite seeing the, uh, the, the West living up to their obligations as yet when it comes to helping out developing countries with financing. Yes, so um, that, that picture of the, of the youth tells us more than just the, the age. It, the, in terms of the risk to climate, it's not just going to be about the heat, it's also going to be the likely conflict. Because with the increased temperatures, we're already seeing it. Um, these, these are, this is a part of the world where um, subsistence agriculture is, is most predominant, um, where there's less of a buffer where there's direct reliance on rivers, on lakes, um, for water, for, for, for life, for livelihood. Um, and having those increased temperatures and everything else that comes with it um, actually leads to what was said before, um, challenges, direct challenges to food security, which is already being experienced. Um, you know, we've seen uh, um, in some parts of East Africa conversations now already about um, about the impact of drought on conflict and, and, and also along the Sahel. So we have a, we've got a horrible combination, potentially, but we've got to turn that from being um, purely us looking down a barrel of risk um, to us being able to see some opportunity. And, and as Zaid has said, we've got to have a balance of optimism. Um, as Kate has said, we've got to be able to find the political will to take on board those solutions. 2027, COP27 is going to be happening in Africa. That conversation has to be much more about adaptation than it's been before. We've got to pin down the conversation on finance. But one thing that we should be one thing we should, we should be happy about, one thing we should be able to celebrate is that we saw at COP26 mm -hmm. more of the private sector than has ever been seen before. And I, it, it, I think that speaks to the fact that the pressure on the outside is beginning to have an impact. We need to and keep that, that pressure that's building. That's a very tangible impact, isn't it, which is very encouraging. Um, the clock is against us, but in, in a nutshell, if I could ask each of you to give me one sentence on what you want people to take away from today and do. We don't want people just to watch and say that was interesting. Uh, Zaid, what should people be taking away and thinking about? Uh, that this doesn't need dramatic adjustments, small adjustments, but huge effects. We do need to consider, and uh, you touched upon this, the dilemmas that we have to think about. We can't live the way we've lived in the last 40 years. We have to live a sustainable lifestyle, mm -hmm. and that does require many of us to change in our habits and the way we think about materialism, consumption, and the need to move towards circular economies. So it's absolutely a must and political leaders need to explain this in a very detailed way to their people. It's, and yeah, that, that's a very key point when you mentioned there about uh, materialism and, and how we consume today. Catherine, what about you? Our future is in our hands. Our actions will make all the difference in the world that determines whether our civilization will continue to thrive or end. And every single one of us has a role to play, and that role begins with using something that every one of us has and that is our voice. Using our voice to advocate for change, why climate change matters and what can be done in every place that we are. We often talk about our carbon footprint in high income countries, but what's bigger than that is our climate shadow. How we engage where we work, where we study, where we live. Every person is part of something bigger than themselves and when we use our voice to advocate for change, that's how the world begins to change too.
climate shadow. That's a really evocative uh, idea there. Yvonne, what about you? Your final takeaway thought on that? Thanks. We've got another opportunity at COP27. It's going to be held on the African continent, um, the continent which is suffering probably possibly most um, and which has the least resources to be able to address this. Um, the build-up to COP26 was was quite considerable. There was a, a lot of media, um, a lot of attention. Um, there's, there's, I feel that at this point in time, we cannot, because it's happening in Egypt, um, allow that momentum to, for, to, to peter away. We need to ensure that that buildup continues. Um, the advocacy for, for adaptation needs to be increased, and we really need to move that one step further, not just the nice uh, commitments, the nationally determined contributions, uh, which no one can actually hold anyone to. We, mm -hmm. we must go into COP27 with accountability. Okay, that's a... Uh, things for people to think about there and some fascinating perspectives throughout. Thank you. I'm not going to let you go away just yet because it's now time to open up the floor with questions from journalists around the world. We're going to start uh, with, a, conversa with a, a question from a representative from uh, Nikkei, the Japanese uh, organisation. If you wouldn't mind, uh, sir, just uh, telling us your name and your question, please. OK, thank you very much for this. Uh, can you hear me? OK. We can hear you perfectly. Can you hear thank you. OK. Okay, so I'm Yasu Takeuchi, journalist uh, of Nikkei, a Jap Japanese Econ Daily. So thank you for this interesting discussion. So, um, my question is about coal. So coal consumption has been increasing, driven by mainly so emerging and developing countries. What should the developed and developing nations do in order to overturn this trend? That's a very, very uh, crucial question that, Catherine, would you like to start us off with that? How do we wean ourselves off this addiction, whether we're developed or developing nations? I will start, but I'd also like to hear my other panelists' opinions as well. Mm -hmm. Coal fueled the Industrial Revolution. It brought us enormous benefits. But just as we no longer use old, outdated types of technology like horses and buggies or party line telephones, in the same way, it is time to move off the most inefficient and dirtiest source of energy we have. Coal is not just responsible for heat trapping gases, it produces air pollution as well. And when you put together all the air pollution from fossil fuels, it's responsible for over 9 million premature deaths around the world. So how can we phase out our coal use? There isn't one magic way, but there's many ways. And one way is to put a price on carbon so we're actually paying the true cost of our coal use. Another way is to recognize, as Yvonne alluded to, that when developed countries go into low-income countries and build coal-fired power plants, they're not doing so as a charitable endeavor. They're doing so in order to sell their coal to those low-income countries. Indeed. Let's pick and up on that point, Catherine, with a couple of the others. Sorry to cut you off on your prime there, but Yvonne, um, coal... We don't just burn it for its, for its own sake, do we? It's wrapped up in the production of materials such as cement and steel, which are vital to the development of nations. So how do we step away from that? Um, yeah, I think it's... We've got to be... We've got to, we've got to take into consideration, as, as Kate was just uh, um, mentioning, um, the true cost of the use of coal. Uh, and one of those is the health impact. Um, you know that can't be that can't be overlooked. Um, it's ac it's easier. It's easily accessed. There, I think there are two points. You, ha you have countries who produce coal in the developing mm -hmm. world, um, so it's not that it's not that scenario of you're selling coal to them. It, it may actually be their easiest source of energy. So it comes back to the finance infrastructure for climate change and for transition. Um, and, I, and I really think that this concept of transition, when we talk about coal, but we also talk about um, um, heavy fuel, um, fuel oil. We, you know, we talk about gas. Um, I think there needs to be, in, in every situation, an understanding that developing countries are going to need access to energy. And, and, and so when it, comes to, when it comes to financing for that energy, it's about making subsidies available. It's about making con you know, concessions. It's about really providing options that make coal not your A1 choice. Because mm. if coal is your A1 choice, your choice between being able to fire industry and have growth or not, then guess what? Countries who didn't enjoy the Industrial Revolution, who want to now have the Industrial Revolution, are going to go for coal. So yes. we have a global responsibility to 
actually provide options. Alternatives. I want to get as many questions as we can from as many journalists in. So let's move on and hear from a journalist at The Standard from Kenya. Please introduce yourself and, and uh, tell us your question. Can you hear me there, Lynette? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. You. Uh, my name is Lynette uh, Otieno, a journalist at the Standard Media Group in Kenya. My question is also around coal, and what I wanted to know is what do you think? How realistic is it? Uh, is the commitment at the COP26, where at least 65 uh, countries or economies, to quit coal uh, dependence? In, in 2030 for the big nations and the 2040s for the development one. Like, uh, how uh, realistic is this mm -hmm. uh, for the desired, uh, to achieve the desired 1.5 degrees Celsius goal? That's, that's a really important question. Thank you. Then that, uh, Zaid, can you answer that one for us, please? How realistic is it that mm -hmm. we can actually meet these commitments? Oh, gosh, you know, if I, if, uh, first of all, the, the, the age of the prophets has, has long gone, and uh, we're so poor at predicting outcomes, uh, especially in cabinet rooms around the world. Um, so I, it's difficult, right? You, you hope the light comes on and, uh, and the penny drops, and they realize that this is no longer a matter of spin and a matter of marketing, but that you really have to go deep and you start to think in, in, in a very uh, considerable way about good governance and what it requires and, and the financing required to uh, help you with the alternatives. You know, when we speak about mitigation and adaptation, we speak about them as two separate things. And as I think both Catherine and Yvonne have said and allu or alluded to, that there is an overlap. There is a point at which all of it overlaps, the finance mitigation and adaptation. You use technologies to buy you time with financing and certain financial flows can be examined in this context uh, to arrest and buy time for the countries that are imperiled. And, you know, one, as, as Yvonne said, we shouldn't just privilege the energy needs of the North over the, the threat, the existential threat to the small island states, developing states, for example, or many of the African states. Catherine, uh, I just want to hear from Catherine on this one as well. Mm -hmm. I see you shaking your head. It, it looks really like. is. That, that is what is at stake. It yeah. is um, people's entire countries. And so, for example, at COP26, one of the most discouraging um, situations was when those small, low-lying island states, when they heard that other countries were not going to take the actions that they had hoped, they realized that in many ways that was almost a death knell. For some of their states. Again, what is at risk is not just, you know, the environment. What is at risk is everything. We humans cannot live without, without what this planet to, provides. And although some of us may be more vulnerable than others, and some of us are already suffering the impacts much more today, and those are the ones who have done the least to contribute to the problem, make no mistake, we are all at risk, and that is why action is needed so urgently at every scale. Uh, I've got another question coming in here. This is from uh, Catherine Dwan uh, from the North America Bureau. Uh, she's the North America Bureau Chief, sorry, at Zena Finance uh, from China. She says, with the ongoing pandemic and various disasters caused by extreme weather events, the current global economic recovery looks like it's going to slow. So how can ESG concepts play a role in promoting global sustainable development? Yvonne, what do you think? Um, I think the, the, we, the, the slowdown of the economy, um, the challenge that we're facing with the pandemic, um, we, we, we've got to appreciate it, as we've all said several times now, that we, we don't have an option. Um, being, able to, being able to continue to progress with the, the commitments made at, at COP, mm -hmm. um, with the Base solutions, etc., that have been mentioned, is the is really the only way forward. Um, okay. our, our context will continue to be challenged. We, we can't use it as an excuse at any okay. point in time. Let's get. To, I want to hear from all our panelists on this one, and uh, we're running out of time. So, Catherine, what about you? Just briefly, if you will. Um, Traditionally, ESG has focused on mitigation, but as my fellow panelists has emphasized again and again, adaptation and building resilience is absolutely essential as climate change is loading the weather dice against us. 
we see that many of our devastating extremes, heat waves, wildfires, tropical cyclones and droughts, are getting more strong, more intense, more damaging in a warmer world. And building resilience is just as important as reducing our emissions, but we have to do both. Yep. Because if we challenge. don't cut our carbon as much as possible, we can't adapt. And what about EZ? Well, most of the uh, financing for E has been in pollution reduction traditionally. It needs to move more into renewables. But uh, correspondingly, you know, and there was this discussion in, in Glasgow where the financing would be 50-50 adaptation, 50% uh, mitigation. And that's, I think, wrong because almost all the private sector financing is going into mitigation. Mm -hmm. So all the public sector financing should be in adaptation. It really should be in adaptation, 100%. We need to leave it divert to the, those leave funds. It to the, um, absolutely. Uh, we've got time for one more, and I know we've got a representative from the Global Mail in Canada waiting patiently in the wings. Uh, would you like to give us your question, please? Oh, there we are. Um, yes, I, my, my question really relates to, I think, what Zaid mentioned, which is the, uh, the bakery slash salami shop that is, is, is COP. And so, um, you know, it's clear that Key countries like China specifically are reluctant to join these multilateral deals, and they're more willing to um, to cut side deals as as coalitions of the willing, as we saw with uh, with America. So I guess my question is: is is COP still the right venue for these discussions, or do we do we need to consider different ways? Okay, that's a really good final question for us. Ed. What about you? What do you think? Is you know, in a sentence, is this the right kind of forum? Yes, of course, it's the right forum. The thing is, they don't use the tools that are used in all other treaty making or treaty sort of monitoring uh, mechanisms. It's a really unusual, strange beast call. It's not the same as in other modes of operations where states set targets, monitor them, intrusive verification, all of that, peer review. Why doesn't it exist in climate change? It's That's something really, really amazing. That's a really amazing. good point. But right, I want to hear from the other two before we go as well, because we're literally down to 30 seconds each. So, Yvonne, you first. Is COP, uh, are COPs out of date? It's what we've got, and we've got to have time to change it um, fundamentally. So, as Zeta said, we need to improve on how it works. OK, that was short and snappy, and uh, thank you. And what about you, Catherine? Essential, but not sufficient. We need action at every level. And in Paris in 2015, the cities gathered in Paris to talk about what cities could do. Corporations gathered to talk about what corporations can do. COP is essential, but again, it is not sufficient. We need everyone. Well, what can I say? We are out of time for this conversation. There's never enough time with a panel of that calibre. Thank you so much, the three of you, for taking part. Now, before we all take a breather, uh, here's some food for thought from one of the world's most influential earth scientists. Here's Johan Rockström, director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change Research. Dear friends and co-citizens of planet Earth, we're not facing a climate crisis. We're in the midst of a global climate crisis. At 1.2 degrees Celsius of global warming caused by us humans, we're in the warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age 20,000 years ago. We went to COP26 in Glasgow on a pathway to disaster, moving towards 2.7 degrees Celsius by the end of this century, a place we haven't been in for the past four to five million years. We left COP26 in Glasgow on a pathway to danger. With the most optimistic assessments, if all pledges are implemented, we could just, just reach below 2 degrees Celsius. So Glasgow was a significant progress, but certainly not enough. The latest research is showing that among the 15 big biophysical tipping element systems that regulates the state of the climate system on planet Earth, everything from the green ice sheet to the Amazon rainforest are now showing increasing evidence that already in the range between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius warming, we enter what I would call today a danger zone. And past 2 degrees Celsius warming, we enter uncharted waters, meaning that, that aiming for a soft landing at 1.5 degrees Celsius is the planetary boundary for a safe and just corridor for humanity's future on Earth. 
Glasgow was a significant progress. Now we need the momentum to continue. The remaining global carbon budget is only 400 billion tons of carbon dioxide remaining to have a two-thirds chance of a soft landing. That gives us up until 2030, this decisive decade, if we continue burning fossil fuels as today. So we have to transition on a carbon law pathway of cutting emissions by half every decade in order to have a chance of an orderly landing by 2050 in a net zero world economy. This means exponential transformative change. It means reductions by 7, 8, 9% of reduction of emissions per year from now onwards. The good news is, leaving Glasgow, that 90% of the global emission of greenhouse gases are today connected to net zero pathways. This is really significant. We also have many countries having 2030 targets, even in, in a handful of countries, put into climate law legislation. We have the pledges on methane, we have pledges on halting deforestation, we have pledges on phasing out coal. So things are happening, we're turning a corner towards leaving the fossil fuel driven planet threatening development paradigm we've been in for the past 150 years. So we have a sequence now in Stockholm Plus 50, Kunming on biodiversity and COP27 in Egypt. So let's use this moment to ramp up momentum and make the transformation towards a safe landing inevitable. It's not lost yet. No science shows that 1.5 is still alive, even though under health care in the intensive unit. But we have to give this a chance now. And this is the moment to accelerate. Yeah, Han Rockstrom, thank you. Well, we're off for a short break and a, a quick uh, drink as well, but we'll be returning with an equally great lineup. Coming up, Ban Ki moon, former UN Secretary General and Deputy Chair of the Elders, and Mary Robinson, former President of Ireland and Chair of the Elders, in an intergenerational conversation with two of the young climate activists who have done so much to shape this debate. This is Generation Green, brought to you by Project Syndicate. See you in a minute. changed once we realized the difference working with nature could make. Back then, we were all about electric cars, renewable energy, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. And they were all crucial, but on their own, they never would have been enough. We were already facing an extinction-level threat. We thought we were doing a lot, but we needed to do even more. Enter nature. The most sophisticated system for processing greenhouse gases in the universe only had hundreds of millions of years on us. We had to stop the planet from warming more than 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the start of the 20th century. Turns out we had to be kind to nature. Hear me out. Stopping the destruction of existing forests, grasslands, and wetlands pulled 3.9 billion metric tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. 
smarter farming and forestry techniques cut another 5.1 billion tons. And restoring the forests and wetlands we had lost scrubbed another two. That's 11 billion tons of carbon removed from the atmosphere. That's like a string of SUVs stuck in bumper to bumper traffic stretching from here to the moon 56 times over. That's one third of the emission reductions we needed. How's it work though? Pick a tree, any tree. Look closer. Trees do this awesome thing called photosynthesis where they soak up rays of sun and pluck carbon from the air to feed themselves. They literally eat the stuff that traps heat in our atmosphere. And have you heard of mangroves? They're like trees, but they live along the coast near bays and beaches. They became all the rage when word got out they could store five times more carbon than their landlocked counterparts. Plus, as they age, trees, all plants really, deposit their carbon into soil. Other plants use that to grow, some of which get eaten by animals, like us, which release carbon back into the atmosphere, starting the whole process over again. It's called the carbon cycle, and it worked really well for a really long time until we overloaded the system by burning fossil fuels and cutting down too many of our forests. It can look very natural now, but protecting and restoring nature at a global level was one of the hardest things we've ever done, and we still had to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. But once we realized it would take more than switching to renewable energy, once we really partnered with nature to reduce our carbon footprint, and also to live on a better planet, that's when we really started to save the world. The 2020s, things were never the same after that. That's when we saved the world. Only, we almost didn't. It all changed once we realized the difference working with nature could make. Back then, we were all about electric cars, renewable energy, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. And they were all crucial, but on their own, they never would have been enough. We were already facing an extinction level threat. We thought we were doing a lot, but we needed to do even more. Enter nature. The most sophisticated system for processing greenhouse gases in the universe only had hundreds of millions of years on us. We had to stop the planet from warming more than 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the start of the 20th century. 
turns out we had to be kind to nature. Hear me out. Stopping the destruction of existing forests, grasslands, and wetlands pulled 3.9 billion metric tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. Smarter farming and forestry techniques cut another 5.1 billion tons. And restoring the forests and wetlands we had lost scrubbed another two. That's 11 billion tons of carbon removed from the atmosphere. That's like a string of SUVs stuck in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic stretching from here to the moon 56 times over. That's one-third of the emission reductions we needed. How's it work, though? Pick a tree. Any tree. Look closer. Trees do this awesome thing called photosynthesis where they soak up rays of sun and pluck carbon from the air to feed themselves. They literally eat the stuff that traps heat in our atmosphere. And have you heard of mangroves? They're like trees, but they live along the coast near bays and beaches. They became all the rage when word got out they could store five times more carbon than their landlocked counterparts. Plus, as they age, trees, all plants really, deposit their carbon into soil. Other plants use that to grow, some of which get eaten by animals, like us, which release carbon back into the atmosphere, starting the whole process over again. It's called the carbon cycle. And it worked really well for a really long time until we overloaded the system by burning fossil fuels and cutting down too many of our forests. It can look very natural now, but protecting and restoring nature at a global level was one of the hardest things we've ever done. And we still had to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. But once we realized it would take more than switching to renewable energy, once we really partnered with nature to reduce our carbon footprint and also to live on a better planet, that's when we really started to save the world. The 2020s, things were never the same after that. That's when we saved the world. Only, we almost didn't. It all changed once we realized the difference working with nature could make. Back then, we were all about electric cars, renewable energy, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. And they were all crucial, but on their own, they never would have been enough. We were already facing an extinction-level threat. We thought we were doing a lot, but we needed to do even more. Enter nature. 
the most sophisticated system for processing greenhouse gases in the universe only had hundreds of millions of years on us. We had to stop the planet from warming more than 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the start of the 20th century. Turns out we had to be kind to nature. Hear me out. Stopping the destruction of existing forests, grasslands, and wetlands pulled 3.9 billion metric tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. Smarter farming and forestry techniques cut another 5.1 billion tons. And restoring the forests and wetlands we had lost scrubbed another two. That's 11 billion tons of carbon removed from the atmosphere. That's like a string of SUVs stuck in bumper to bumper traffic stretching from here to the moon 56 times over. That's one third of the emission reductions we needed. How's it work though? Pick a tree, any tree. Look closer. Trees do this awesome thing called photosynthesis where they soak up rays of sun and pluck carbon from the air to feed themselves. They literally eat the stuff that traps heat in our atmosphere. And have you heard of mangroves? They're like trees, but they live along the coast near bays and beaches. They became all the rage when word got out they could store five times more carbon than their landlocked counterparts. Plus, as they age, trees, all plants really, deposit their carbon into soil. Other plants use that to grow, some of which get eaten by animals, like us, which release carbon back into the atmosphere, starting the whole process over again. It's called the carbon cycle, and it worked really well for a really long time until we overloaded the system by burning fossil fuels and cutting down too many of our forests. It can look very natural now, but protecting and restoring nature at a global level was one of the hardest things we've ever done. And we still had to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. But once we realized it would take more than switching to renewable energy, once we really partnered with nature to reduce our carbon footprint and also to live on a better planet, that's when we really started to save the world. The 2020s, things were never the same after that. That's when we saved the world. Only, we almost didn't. It all changed once we realized the difference working with nature could make. Back then, we were all about electric cars, renewable energy, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. And they were all crucial, but on their own, they never would have been enough. 
We were already facing an extinction level threat. We thought we were doing a lot, but we needed to do even more. Enter nature. The most sophisticated system for processing greenhouse gases in the universe only had hundreds of millions of years on us. We had to stop the planet from warming more than 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the start of the 20th century. Turns out we had to be kind to nature. Hear me out. Stopping the destruction of existing forests, grasslands, and wetlands pulled 3.9 billion metric tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. Smarter farming and forestry techniques cut another 5.1 billion tons. And restoring the forests and wetlands we have not... And welcome back to Generation Green, brought to you by Project Syndicate. I'm Darshini David. Well, the Heirs of Inaction is the name of this, our second session of the day, where we'll be opening up the floor to contributors of all ages to understand what lies ahead for Generation Green. In just a moment, we'll be joined by Mary Robinson, former President of Ireland and Chair of the Elders, in conversation with young climate activists and exploring the tensions and common ground between people of different ages. But first, here's former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, with his take on the issue. Today's adults are shaping the world which the future generations will inherit. But too many are doing so recklessly selfishly and with no sense of responsibility for the consequences of their actions. The world our children are inheriting is not yet a safe, sustainable or fair world they deserve. During COP26, research was released indicating that even with all new policy pledges considered, Global warming could only be limited to a 2.4 degrees Celsius rise by 2100. This temperature rise would mean anybody aged under 30 years old is all but guaranteed to be alive in a world where we will face terrible fires, devastating floods and droughts, and where millions of people will be forced to leave their homes. In Kalyanpur slum, there are no road names. Every year, climate change is forcing half a million Bangladeshis from their rural homes. There will be a disproportionate climate change burden for young generations in the global south. Young people are very aware of the intergenerational injustice of the climate crisis. They have rightly been demanding all the people in positions of authority are held to account for their inaction. Leaders need to listen to them and act in a way that meets their concerns. These young activists embody the solidarity that our leaders have thus far failed to demonstrate. They speak up not only for themselves, for four generations as yet unborn. The elders believe intergenerational dialogue is vital in addressing the climate crisis. The clarity, commitment, and energy of young people, combined with the experience and wisdom of older generations, can act as a powerful catalyst for climate action. We all have a part to play in addressing the climate crisis, especially those with the power needed to bring about change. Climate change is a defining crisis of our time. The elders call on all generations to step up 
to the challenges and to take collective responsibility to do what is needed. As the elders founder Nelson Mandela once said, I quote, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you. Thank you, Moon, Deputy Chair of the Elders. Now, just a reminder, you don't need to run the United Nations to be part of the conversation today. We're all witnesses to an extraordinary piece of history. So do please let us know what today's conversations mean to you in your life using the hashtag Generation Green. But now, we've been hearing about them throughout today's programme. Youth activists have helped shape the climate movement and pushed it up the global agenda in a way that so many similar movements simply fail to do. We'll be giving young people the centre stage. In just a moment, we'll be hearing from two activists. They are Mitzi Janelle Tan and Elizabeth Wanjiru Bathuti in conversation with Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland and chair of the Elders. But first, young voices from around the world assembled with the help of One Young World. I am from the countryside of Buenos Aires, Argentina, India, Latvia, Nigeria, Bangladesh, the United States of America, Qatar. I'm from Honduras, which is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to the adverse impacts of climate change. Our communities are being affected more frequently by extreme heat waves and wildfires, cyclones, Waves. Landslides, uh, river erosion, temperatures, and water scarcity. Overflooding that happened during rainy season. This has led to loss of lives. It is harder and harder for youth, especially in rural areas, to find employment. So imagine how we live in these dire conditions. If you talk to grandparents and parents, they do realize that the temperature wasn't this hot in the past, and the change has been drastic. By 2050, part of the country will be underwater. It is quite clear to everyone that future and younger generations are at a greater risk from global warming. The anxiety young people feel about whether the planet that they love so much and that they have known their whole lives is going to be livable. I am worried and not hopeful at all. If someone from the future generation sees this film, I would say, you are lucky. Blaming people, it's the worst thing that we could do because normally the people, they don't know that they're doing something wrong. Middle-aged people, that generation is the one that caused all this problem and many of them are not ready to make changes. However, it is important to consider that many of the innovators and strongest advocates for climate action are older. So often, people who are a bit older than me tend to say, oh, the new generation, you are here to save the world. Well, I have news for you. All of us on this planet are in it together, and you can't dump responsibility on the generations that follow. The climate issue is an issue of all. We can make a difference if all generations come together. We can work together. Put simply, the older generation occupies positions of influence and power. The action that needs to happen is action. It's not pretty speeches at summits or photo ops or tokenistic involvement of young people. The time to act is yesterday, but the next best option is immediately today. Generation Green, this is our generation. We will and we shall fight together to coexist in this beautiful world. The voices there of ambassadors for One Young World are thanks to them. Now, just a final reminder that we really do want to bring in as many voices as possible today, and that does include you. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Do get your phone out and get involved in the conversation using the hashtag, you're probably used to it by now, Generation Green. And if you think today's topic matters to anyone else, you know, it's very, very easy to send a WhatsApp. In uh, just a little while, we'll be bringing in another panel of journalists from around the world, but with enormous pleasure. I'd like to hand over to Mary Robertson, Chair of the Elders and former President of Ireland, and two of the world's most prominent youth activists, Mitzi Janelle Tan and Elizabeth Wanjiru Bathuti. Mary, with great pleasure, can I leave it to you to kick things off? Thank you very much indeed. I'm very excited about this conversation. 
I, I'm interested, I hadn't heard it put that way, heirs to inaction, meaning you ha you're loaded, the younger generation, with the failure of my generation and the generation after me to take the steps we should have taken. And of course, I accept that responsibility. But I'm glad to say that I had the pleasure at, at uh, COP26 of meeting both Mitzi Jean Eltan. Uh, we met because she was one of the bloggers um, who'd blogged for the elders. And I met with a group of you, and we had a great chat together, if you remember, Mitzi. And then I also met Elizabeth a little later on, toward the end of the COP. I had been wanting to meet you because my, my, Manjira Mathai had told me what a wonderful woman you were. And my life wouldn't be complete without meeting you. So I can, you can tell I'm excited to meet you both. And, you know, I think it's, it's clear, you know, as uh, Ban Ki-moon said in the opening thing, you know, the intergenerational dialogue is vital. But we're, you know, we're at the other, at the two ends of that. Um, I'm at the older end, you're at the younger end. We also need to get those in the middle who have more power. And I'd love to hear maybe both of you uh, starting maybe with you, Mitzi, and then um, uh, Elizabeth, um, you know, how do we use our power uh, of voice to encourage more action by those who have the power to make change, real change? So, Mitzi? I think it's so important for us to all come together and fight for justice. I honestly hate the narrative that goes it's the older generation versus the younger generation, because I don't believe that. It's not the older indigenous people, it's not the older farmers and the older fisher folk and the older people in the global south necessarily. It's a very specific sect of older people. It's the fossil fuel industries, it's the multinational companies, it's the world leaders. And as you said, it's the people in the middle age and the middle of our age spectrum who are in power now. And they're the ones that we have to be changing and moving. And it will take all of us coming together in order to do that. And Elizabeth, you know, when you come in, you said something interesting, you know, a while ago about needing also to show our feelings for this. And so I'd like you to speak about how we get the middle in, the powerful middle, and, and how we make them empathize with what we're talking about. One of the ways I would say that we can make everyone to be a part of this is to accept the fact that we have a serious issue of intergenerational inequity. And then make sure that we understand that the people who are in high levels of power right now are not the ones who are going to be the most impacted by the decisions that are being made today. It's going to be the young people. But again, in order to change everything, we will need to have everyone on board. And I strongly believe also in the power of using love and compassion, the power of making sure that people understand and feel it in themselves to understand the injustices that have gone into the climate crisis. And this is only going to happen if we also deal with the crisis of both listening and feeling. We have to listen to one another and then we have to be able to feel the consequences that we have brought to other people that have least contributed to this crisis. Yeah, um, you know, I, I like the way both of you have responded. And I think we do have more sense of urgency about this crisis. There's no doubt about that. And I think we're more focused now on the need to reduce emissions, mitigation, the need to help adaptation. I hope we'll talk more about loss and damage because that's extraordinarily important. But I'd like us, I'd like both of you, uh, because the, the, the video that we saw made it clear, we will not get there without nature-based solutions. Um, I know both of you have been involved in, and, and particularly you, Elizabeth, so I'll start with you this time because I know the work. You planted your first three, tree at the age of seven. I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking of climate until much, much later in my life. So um, I, I want both of you to talk about the importance of nature-based solutions being fundamental um, to uh, being able to achieve uh, a sustainable world. So Elizabeth first. Every time I talk about nature, I love to insist on the fact that we are nature and we cannot act as though we are not a part of nature. And so as the entire human race, we have to understand that we really need nature to be able to tackle the climate crisis and also understand that we are both in a climate and the ecological crisis. And unless we have nature destruction right now, then walking backwards when it comes to tackling this crisis. And there are so many ways in which we can 
nature-based solutions. And it's really great to see that most of these solutions are being led by young people, especially from countries in the global south that are the most impacted by this crisis. And these are solutions that are every day helping people not only be able to connect with nature, but also helping us in terms of tackling the climate and the ecological crisis. And so I think what is happening right now is that we need to bring nature into the, into, into the conversation. And it was great to see uh, nature really being discussed at COP26, but really what needs to happen is we need to have immediate action when it comes to nature-based solutions. And then all the solutions that are happening right now need to be fully funded as well. And it's vital to also realize that in addition to focusing on nature restoration, it's also important that we make sure that we are keeping the remaining natural ecosystems intact. And that is something that we most often not talk about because there are also big corporations and industries that are using nature-based solutions and as an cut emissions. So we cannot fail to discuss the two issues at the same time. Um, do you mean, um, when you say big corporations, the sort of offsetting that's going on, um, so buying, offsetting, uh, that may be no quality at all, just planting numbers of trees in bad places and they die and then they plant more trees. Is that is that what you're talking about? Exactly. And I think it's a missing conversation because we need to be saying that in addition to stopping investments in fossil fuels, we also have to massively increase nature regeneration and then make sure that we stop every action that is fueling deforestation and fueling nature destruction. But most often we find uh, the greenwashing aspect of it where people are saying that we are planting trees, but then they are using that as an excuse to not... So it has to go a long way. It has to be two ways. We have to cut emissions and at the same time make sure that we are increasing nature regeneration. Yeah, and I love the way you started your answer by saying we are nature. Um, I, I, I think it's really important that we feel that more, that we know that more. Um, I've learned a lot from indigenous peoples and I, you know, kind of, uh, I'm still, I think a little bit distance from able to say, you know, I am nature in the way that you did. Um, but I really need to work at that uh, because it's true and we need to think about it. So Mitzi, uh, how do you see nature being part of the solution? And, uh, you know, the Philippines has been terribly affected by climate. Talk a little bit about your own country and what you're doing on nature-based solutions there, maybe. I agree so much with what Liz mentioned about how we are part of nature. I think colonialism and capitalism has made us think that nature is something that we are a part of, a resource to be used, but we are part of the ecosystem and we have to protect it. And it's so important that when we talk about the ecological and the climate crisis, we stem it into that colonialist history that we're seeing that that's why we're viewing nature as something that can just be used. And that's why we're, you know, um, planting trees in the name of the environment, but really just to cut it down and using that as a carbon offset. And it's so important that we really demand not just nature-based solutions and not just um, mitigation and adaptation from world leaders, but really emission cuts are so important. In the Philippines, as you mentioned, we have been hit by typhoon after typhoon after typhoon, yet the projects that are being prioritized here are projects that are cutting down mangroves, projects that are um, making white man-made white sand beaches, um, reclamation projects that have airports. And so we're holding campaigns constantly to make sure that these mangroves are protected so that the fisher folks are also protected because it's really them who's defending the oceans and we're only joining their fight. Yeah. And, you know, Mitzi, you mentioned the devastating um, hurricanes, the cyclones that are hitting um, the Philippines and other small island states and other parts of the world. Um, uh, I, I want us to talk about a tough subject because you're young and this is what we need to be really making action on. I'm talking about loss and damage. We saw at the COP26, uh, we saw the G77, um, a huge move and young people and civil society wanting a Glasgow financial facility. And then bang at the end, in a painful way, it was watered down to dialogues um, over three years. Um, let me let me ask both of you, and I'll let you start this one, Mitzi, um, uh, about your sense of how we're going to tackle loss and damage and how seriously we must do it. Honestly, it felt like a betrayal to hear world leaders toss aside, global north leaders especially. And really, it has to start 
from the grassroots. We have to start talking more and more about how the climate crisis is already here, more and more about how we need to fix this and that Global North countries don't have a solidarity with Global South countries. That's why they need to pay and give reparations, but because they caused the climate crisis. And it's not solidarity. It's not a debt. It's supposed to be reparations. And we, they owe that to the Global South countries that are um, experiencing these loss and damages right now. And to be able to do that, we really have to keep connecting with one another across the globe and doing all kinds of activism, like street activism, but also talking to policymakers and, and talking to your local governments and to your local politicians so that they also um, bring the topic of loss and damage into the international scene. We really need a global collaboration to make sure that this is something that happens. Well, Elizabeth, uh, the next COP is going to be on your continent, COP27. It's going to be in Egypt. But I hear a lot of um, you know, conversation about the fact, yes, Egypt will have the presidency of the COP, but it has to be a really African COP to crack this issue of loss and damage. How do you feel about it? We definitely need a uh, separate for loss and damage. And one of the things that we have seen is the fact that we need to realize that still exist. And the fact that right now, the 1 billion inhabitants of sub only responsible for just half a percent of historical emissions, but then the temperatures are rising 1.5 times faster here. And this is not climate justice. And this is only going to be more floods, more prolonged droughts, more heat waves, and more disasters for people that are living in the African continent. And this is going to mean that the long not something that we are going to expect in the future. It's something that is happening right now. And so what we expect and the reason why young people keep saying that we need to turn words into action is there are people right now whose lives and livelihoods depend on the decisions that are made. And so if we meet at the cops and really deliver something that is not people whose lives and livelihoods right now depend on that, then it means that we are not being just enough. And just because COP is coming to Africa, we cannot just conclude that it's going to be an African COP. It has to really start in the planning and everything that is happening right now to make sure that it's really inclusive for all the Africans. And it also needs to ensure that the challenges right now that the African continent is facing are on the front line. And we cannot talk about these challenges without loss and damage in the picture. I would say COP26 failed to deliver that. And even though the, we still did not see countries stepping forward to take leadership on loss and damage and to also pro provide this fund. And even for the previous finances, we have failed to see the trust. We have pledges after pledges, but really none is being fulfilled. So we have to make this COP different. If it's, if it's really a COP, an African COP, then let's really make it an African COP, even in terms of the outcome that comes out, comes out of that COP. I see um, Mitzi uh, nodding as you were speaking, and you were nodding as she was speaking. I think you both have a sense that uh, this could be the real COP that is inclusive of people's voices and the importance of the voices of those who face beyond ad adaptation, who face uh, what cannot be adapted to, wiping out, uh, wiping out livelihoods in a, in a way that cannot be recovered um, very easily, uh, in other words, into real um, loss and damage. And I think, you know, so many parts of the world that are not responsible for the problem uh, are facing this earlier than other parts of the world. Um, it is affecting the Northern Hemisphere now. We're waking up to the fact that we have far more fires, far more uh, flooding, far more real impacts. But nonetheless, um, the, the, the real uh, injustice of climate change is in the Global South. And therefore, the Global South at this COP will have to make sure that their issues are addressed and are meaningful. And another one that I want to tackle, because it's an e issue that we don't think about enough, is access to energy there is a you know um, a sense uh, of getting rid of fossil fuel and we know that we need to reduce emissions but i'm learning through the conversations with women leaders in particular that having gas as a just transition in africa may be necessary as long as it's seen as a transition and it, it can be transitioned out i'd love to hear what both of you think of that um, and again, I'll start with you, Elizabeth, this time. Uh, you're in Kenya. 
It's a country with a lot of initiatives on energy. I'm not sure how much you're dependent on gas in, 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 in Kenya, but Nigeria, for example, would be very dependent on gas in as a short term to get the base load so people have access to energy. I mean, my understanding is that at least 600 million people in um, Africa don't have access to electricity and about 900 million uh, don't have clean cooking. So uh, let's talk about that. So I come from a country that is depending a lot on renewables. But again, when it comes to transitioning, we cannot forget that we need to have a just transition and also realize that really most of the African countries really also have still have a challenge to access to electricity, like you have mentioned. And so we need to have a just transition. And that means also that that cannot be the same uh, for, for example, for like the G20 countries that are for 80% of uh, emissions. And we cannot forget to look at historical emissions as well when it comes to a just transition. So we have to also realize that we are talking about a continent contributed to less than 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So every plan that we are coming up right now in terms of transitioning, it has to be just. And by just, it means that it has to make sure that also the African continent is in a position to all continue growing and to also continue developing without also uh, emissions. And this is only going to be made possible if there is climate finance. And even if we talk about a just transition, it's not going to be possible if the finance that we're talking about right now is not available, because then the finance that Africa has is going to be used to be able to address the challenges that come as a result of the climate crisis, which we have not even contributed. So I would say I am for a just transition. And that means in terms of timelines and also making sure that we put historical emissions into account. Thank you. I know we're running out of time, but Mitzi, I'd love to hear you on this too, on just transition. It's the same for us in the Philippines. We can't transition yet because we have been kept from developing. We have been kept from developing because of the historical and current impact of colonialism. The, the, a single male, we can't process that in our own country because we haven't been able to industrialize because again of the system that we have today. And so when it comes to bringing down the fossil fuel industry, the global north has to be the one that starts now because they are perfectly capable of transitioning completely just for their workers as well um, into a renewable energy system. And that is only the beginning. And then they have to pay reparations as Liz already mentioned, we need finance in order to do this and not just finance, but also technology transfer, intellectual property, right? Otherwise we'll see the same thing with the COVID vaccine where Global South countries aren't able to get vaccines because of the intellectual property rights. And so bringing down the fossil fuel industry is a first step. And then we also have to talk about how we consume energy in the first place, because if we keep consuming energy in the same rate as we are now, in the same pace as we are now, renewable energy, the mining that, that has to happen with us, the child labor that happened because just to get the minerals to get the renewable energy, it's another justice issue that we also have to talk about. And so it's more than just transitioning into renewable energy. It's also about changing the way we view development in general from the everlasting growth of the global north based on the overexploitation of the global south into the quality of people's lives everywhere. You know, listening to both of you really gives me hope because you're so smart, you're so positioned. Um, you get the link with nature, the, we are nature, you get the need to change the power structures, you get the need to uh, address the just transition issues. Uh, you know, you, there are thousands, millions of you all over the world, and you are the hope for the future. This generation won't take um, any messing. Um, you're going to go forward. And I'm really proud that you know, we can have this intergenerational conversation and really understand how important it is that your voice is there and heard at COPS and beyond COPS and in um, you know, the whole movement forward. I think we have to 
you know, break now and, and let some journalists in or something. But anyway, <laughs> uh, let's stay with it and see what happens. Well, it's a shame to interrupt your conversation, Mary uh, Mitzi and Elizabeth. It's been an absolutely fascinating listen and a privilege too. And you've covered so much ground. I think we are nature is a takeaway uh, that we want people to remember. But as you say, Mary, it is time to bring in some of the journalists who've been waiting patiently. And we've got quite a lot of questions. And we're going to hear once again from a representative from Nikkei in Japan. So over to you, please, can you read Introduce yourself to our panel and, and uh, put forward your question. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Yasuo Takeuchi uh, of Nikkei, a journalist, so Japanese Economic Daily. So thank you for uh, this interesting debate. So my question is about generation gap. So as I have seen the movement by young people in the world, they successfully managed to set climate change as a political agenda. So all the politicians unanimously say that the uh, fight against climate change is paramount. However, while all the adults tend to take moderate measures, younger people insist on the necessity to take bolder measures. I think that we need a kind of schemes to introduce the voice of young generations to concrete policies. What should we do to take up the voices of young people? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And, uh, you know, who better to ask than our young activists? Um, let's start with you, Elizabeth. What do we need to do to make sure that younger voices are heard when it comes to formulating policies? I would say we need young people in the decisions where, in, in the places where the real decisions are being made and not on the sidelines, the first step. And to also recognize that young people are actually doing this to be able to shape the kind of world they want to live in. And we're not going to have a safe future without a present that is actually habitable and livable for us. So we have to recognize young people as key stakeholders and not have them on the sidelines. And then we have to meaningfully and genuinely engage young people in the whole process. And this has to be beyond tokenistic. And even when we share what we want to see changing we need to see these things being applied in the final decisions because many other times when we speak okay. up as young people uh, and share what we want to see but then it doesn't really reflect that's in the a really good final point decision. that's a really good point elizabeth uh, mitzi what's your view on this because are there other examples of things which are working well honestly i don't think there are good examples because if there were we'd be seeing world leaders actually acting but we're not seeing that anywhere and so what we need is active youth participation, not just youth represented in the tables and in the offices, but the government and the leaders going out into the cities, into the countryside, into the communities that are being impacted and actively consulting the youth and not just consultation, but also actively empowering the youth with the education needed so that they can participate. Thank you, Mitzi. Um, Dr. Mercy Correa has been waiting patiently. She's from the Institute of Health and Science from the Standard in Kenya. Um, would you like to uh, put your question to the panel, please? Yes, uh, definitely. And this um, is just picking up from the conversation from the panelists um, discussing the issue of the global north and global south. So my question is, um, is, do the panelists think that the leadership of the world's most polluting countries or regions are doing enough to reverse global warming? And if not, what needs to be done to address that, considering that at the end of the day, charity begins at home. And this is particularly, and I'm happy that the panelists are all women and young, um, that the ones who are going to bear the biggest brunt of, global, or, of climate change are women and the youth. That's a really good question. Uh, Mary, that's something you were alluding to a bit earlier, conversations with female leaders. So would you like to, to answer that one? Yeah, I, I think it's important if we're going to have a real bridge between the global north and the global south, we have to talk about injustice. You know, the injustices um, linked to climate change are at least fivefold. The fact that it disproportionately affects the poorest countries, the poorest communities, small island states, indigenous peoples who are least responsible and who happened to be the brown and black people in our world. So there's a racial injustice. Secondly, the, gen the gender injustice within that. Women have different social roles, different power, different access to credit, sometimes different rights, like land rights. Um, thirdly, the intergenerational injustice that young people have talked about. Fourthly, the injustice of the uh, way in which different regions um, have come to economic um, uh, uh, prosperity. 
the um, industrialized countries, we built our economies on fossil fuel. Now we're trying to stop other countries from having fossil fuel who haven't got access to electricity. And we're trying to do it in a way that's very unjust in some ways because we don't see it. And then fifthly, the injustice to nature herself, the you know, loss of biodiversity, the, the stupid mistakes we've made. So if we can talk about injustice more, which young people see and get, yep. um, I think we will build a bridge between north and south on climate, which would be good for our world when and we talk about living in a sustainable world. We're, we're almost running out of time. I want to hear quickly from Mitzi and Elizabeth on this. Mitzi, you first. It's so nice to see an all-female panel on this. I completely agree with what Mary has already said. I don't think any Global North leaders right now are doing enough. And what they need to do is drastic emission cuts, just transition, bringing down the fossil fuel industry, reparations from the Global North to the Global South, and so much more. It's really a systemic change that we need. And we know that the system that brought us into the climate crisis isn't going to be the system that brings us out of it. So it's really about changing everything and it mm. all starts with recognizing justice as Mary mentioned. That's a very, very apt description of the system. Elizabeth, how about you? I also think they still done because while the nations have still fallen short in their pledges to support countries like mine and those in sub and those other in sub Saharan Africa to deal with the worst impacts of and this is not climate justice. At the same time emissions are still rising that have least contributed continue to bear the worst impact. So if anything is going to change, it has to be through so much pressure. And this pressure is going to come from the people who strongly understand the injustices that people have to bear as a result of the climate crisis. Thank you. Uh, a couple more questions I want to squeeze in. We're almost running out of time here. Catherine Dwan, North America Bureau Chief from Cedar Finance for China, has asked the IPCC's latest report, Climate Change 2021, a natural science basis, states that limiting warming to 1.5 percent or even sorry, 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees will not be achievable unless immediate action is taken to massively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This describes a relatively pessimistic outlook for us. What do you think of this warning? What changes do we need to make, make to make real progress in tackling climate change? I want to ask you just briefly, so 30 seconds each if you don't mind, starting with you, Mary, for an answer to that. When the uh, IPCC brought out their special report on 1.5 degrees warming, they warned us that it needed transformational change. But they said it is doable if you have the political will. It is doable. We can do it. We didn't lose possibilities in Glasgow. We kept it alive that we can align with 1.5. Now we've got to have this COP27 really bring this home by real transformative change. Elizabeth, what about you? I would say that we can actually make things change, but this has to be our defining year of action and a time to meet all the previous pledges, especially for countries that are still behind in fulfilling previous pledges, because we cannot live on words and commitments alone. It has to be through action. And so countries have to act on their promises and make sure that we are putting people and our planet above profits. Thank you. And Mitzi, how about you? I don't think it's a warning. I think it's a challenge. We shouldn't be pessimistic. We cannot give up hope because we cannot compromise in our lives. And that's why on March 26th, Fridays the Future is going in a global climate strike across the globe, uh, demanding people, not profit, because we know that we cannot give up. OK, thank you. And uh, waiting patiently, the final question goes to uh, someone from the diplomatic career in the US. So would you like to introduce yourself and ask the panel your question? I think you might have your mic off. Do you mind unmuting yourself? That's not embarrassing at all. That's better. Uh, I think. I'm the managing editor of Diplomatic Courier. We're a global affairs media publication. Um, this has been a really nice, really nice discussion, and it plays into kind of what my question was. Uh, we talked about north-south injustices. We talked about the need for action right now, so so urgently, sort of where we're coming up against the line. It, and also the way that this impetus has been put on sort of the younger generation unfairly, saying you have to be the change makers, you have to carry this forward. Uh, so I guess my question has to do with legacy actors, whether we're talking about corporate or institutional, and in sort of they have all this responsibility for some of this inaction. We talk about errors of inaction as, as the theme here. 
we're probably going to have to count on some of these actors to reform and become really powerful forces for combating climate change. And so my question is, what actors do you think that we could count on to make that shift and how can we actually build that trust? Oh, that's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, Mary, could I pass that one to you, please? I think I'm going to quote Elizabeth. I think she said that we cannot do it without everyone. Everyone has to do their part. Um, so I do think that uh, corporate leaders um, in the world today have a huge responsibility, basically, uh, in their companies and in their way of doing um, to change very dramatically. Um, the uh, out of um, so the, the sort of rampant capitalism that we see, which leads to the inequality, uh, which is frightening in our world. Um, the fact that, you know, in our COVID time, billionaires have made billions and the rest of us, you know, have suffered, not equally, but some have suffered far more than others. That's not acceptable in our world today. So uh, I, I do think that there is a, a huge responsibility to remember our humanity and our links um, with uh, the future generations being our children and grandchildren and having a safe world. And that means greater responsibility for those who are responsible for more of the problem that we face. Uh, Missy, if I, if I could ask for you, because we're running out of time, just for a sentence or two to give us your thoughts on this. I completely agree. We need everyone and we need these actors to change. And if they refuse to change, then they will be pushed aside and people who are willing to change will take their place. Thank you. And Elizabeth, we heard Mary there starting with your words. Is there anything you'd like to add? I totally agree with Mary and Mitzi. Just to add that we have to also admit that some have got more work to Thank you. Uh, well, I'm afraid to say that is all we've got time for today. I'd like to say a huge thank you to the three of you. It's been an utterly fascinating discussion. In fact, thank you to all our contributors for making this a fantastic event. Thanks also to the team behind the scenes who've worked so hard to put this together. But most of all, thank you to you, the audience watching. We really would not have anything. It would be nothing without you. I'm Darshini David, and this has been Generation Green, brought to you by Project Syndicate. We'll leave you with the thoughts of one of today's sponsors, Andrew Serizin, president of the Templeton World Charity Foundation. Goodbye. Templeton World Charity Foundation, where I'm president, is grateful for the opportunity to join you and the next generation of leaders advocating for our future. You've chosen to take up this challenge to turn back climate change in a time when a different global crisis has changed all the rules. In short, you've asked, how can you flourish? I'm here to tell you some undoubtedly good news, that there's a profound and growing science behind how we flourish. At Templeton World Charity Foundation, we're devoting $60 million to build a community of researchers, innovators, advocates, and policymakers dedicated to the field of human flourishing, that a powerful set of tools in our arsenal include hope, gratitude, and purpose. Philosophers and scientists have actually defined hope as having three different elements. The first two are desire, I want to help save the planet, and belief, I think that it's possible for me to make a difference. You might be hope skeptic. You may be remembering as I do when Greta Thunberg told world leaders. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I think that what she was reacting against was actually a kind of naive or superficial idea of hope. The philosopher Cornel West actually put it best when he said, real hope is grounded in a particularly messy struggle and can be betrayed by naive projections of a better future that ignore the necessity of doing the real work. And for me, what we can learn from this important body of research is that real hope contains not only a desire to make things better, the belief that it is possible to do so, but also the reason to justify why it's important. We look up and see how our lives are sustained and supported by forces that transcend our individual lives. We see that the environment provides sufficiency and surplus 
and we remember that we are bound inextricably to the world that surrounds us. In a remarkable new set of studies, research has shown that gratitude can drive sustainable action that includes extraction of fewer resources from a common pool. People who experience gratitude towards nature are morally concerned and intrinsically motivated to act responsibly, and they take action more readily in their own lives. I'll end my speech today with a note that climate action offers a profound opportunity for advocates such as yourselves to flourish individually too by finding purpose in your work. In writing about the power of purpose, Friedrich Nietzsche wrote, those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. And in this context of the crucial actions that you have devoted your lives to advocate for, I would extend this statement. Those who have a, a why to live can achieve almost any what. So I ask only that as you continue your work you remember how hope, gratitude, and purpose can accelerate a future where all of humanity flourishes. Thank you.